Patriotism was an American prerequisite, and patriotism meant supporting the government's military. My views were profoundly neoconservative. But what changed a few years ago is I simply began to ask the question, why? Between reading about the ideas of peace and conversations with friends about the nature of morality and truth, I came to understand two things. First, that all people everywhere have the God-given right to life, liberty, and property, not just people in this country. These rights are inalienable, and the young person in Yemen has the same rights that I do in the same way. Second, I began to see that these moral truths don't just apply in this arbitrary section of Earth called America. They apply to everyone, everywhere, and all the time. If it's wrong for me to do here, it's also wrong for me to do elsewhere, or even with, if a, gr a group agrees with me. This especially includes violence waged with popular or state sanction. This is war. Simply the fact that somebody calls it a war does not make it right. The conventions and traditions of men can't change the morality of any given act, nor can the words used to describe it justify it. These ideas changed my outlook on many things, but most significantly how I saw war, and in particular the current war. Once I came to see that crucial point um, I was willing to ask the question why. I was able to see what war really is. As General Smedley Butler said, war is a racket. I was actually able to see that when Jesus was saying, blessed are the peacemakers, he meant it. It wasn't a comfortable truth, but the truth rarely is. As a Christian, I see things that Jesus said now, and I don't, and don't understand why the church doesn't speak out against it more. It should be among the, the most prominent issues they talk about. But it's sadly quite the opposite today. There's an idea that was once popular in Christian circles that a war must, be, must meet certain very stringent defensive criteria in order to be justified. And it's sad to see that the idea has been almost completely lost in many churches. In a time where I believe Christians should be standing to oppose war and all its tools, churches serve as recruiting posts for the American military leviathan. This is in stark contrast to Christians of the early church who refused to serve in Rome's army refused to be captured and conscripted for the Roman Empire. I hope to see this trend reversed. After my own personal change of heart, I, came to, I, I saw just how deeply rooted the ideas of war are entrenched in many minds. It's a cycle of fear, in some cases, fed by propaganda from many willing sources. Fear is the message that the government wants to spread, and the media generally goes along with it for many reasons. Sometimes they don't want to lose their contacts in the government where the news begins. Sometimes they have an agenda and are willing participants. The war on terror requires a war on truth in order to keep people afraid of some boogeyman that we don't understand. This is a constant feature of war. And even back after the end of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur said, always there has been some terrible evil at home or some monstrous foreign power that was going to gobble us up if we didn't blindly rally behind it. Fear and apathy feed the deception which keep people from seeing war for what it really is. It is a tool of political policy and it is evil. It is one of the horrors inflicted on the world by the modern state and it is the single greatest cause of the destruction of our liberties. War is where the rich of one country send the poor out to fight the poor of another country. Modern warfare holds innocent people hostage to politicians who care only for their own objectives. People are broken, injured, burned, destroyed, and cast out of their homes. And for what? To kill a few more suspected militants? People who are likely fighting Americans because Americans are fighting them in their own countries? Empire creates terrorism, which then becomes its own excuse. It is a self-perpetuating self feedback loop, and there's only one direction that it leads to, death, poverty, and tyranny. Today, we see American military presence in over 100 countries, occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan, drone strikes and other covert operations in Yemen, Libya, Pakistan, and Somalia. And on top of that, the powers that be are trying to get us to support invading Iran and now Syria. The U.S. just sent several hundred troops and Patriot missiles to Turkey, supposedly to protect them from spillover violence into Syria. And now we see the U.S. pushing support for the Syrian rebels, some of whom they have just labeled as a terrorist group. There is no end to the regime's lust for war. And why are these wars going on? 
We're told that we must wage an unending war on terror. We're told we must give up our liberty and our privacy for fear of men with turbans in the Middle East who hate us because we're prosperous and free. We're told we must destroy all the terrorists because of what they did to us on 9-11. But do they seriously expect us to believe the stories that the military-industrial complex in, in influenced government want us to believe? The war on terrorism is essentially colonialism 2.0. Conquering these territories, extending influence over them and others by force is imperialism, and empire creates terrorism. It is said that war is the terrorism of the rich and that terrorism is the war of the poor. We see this going on in Afghanistan today, a place that is known as the graveyard of empires. The Afghans don't see the US as a liberator. They see an occupying force in their land, acting with impunity. If people who live there think they are being occupied by a foreign enemy, it follows that they would attack that enemy and do what they could to drive them out. Something that many don't get is that occupation and war is a cycle. The more land you occupy, the more wars you wage, the more you will have people that live there fight back. Sadly, the number of reasons for them to fight are increasing. Recently, the Army Times wrote in an article entitled, Some Afghan Kids Aren't Bystanders, about Marines in Afghanistan who thought they spied some shadowy figures planting an improvised explosive device, and they called it an airstrike. It turns out that the targets were in fact children aged 8, 10, and 12. Their family said that they were out gathering dung to fuel a fire. In the, Ar in the article, Army Lieutenant Colonel Marion Carrington said, in addition to looking for military-aged males, we're looking for children with potential hostile intent. Does anyone here get the feeling that if this is what it's come to, we're fighting the wrong war? These children are not alone among the dead. The CIA is operating an extensive drone warfare program which is killing thousands of people in Yemen and especially Pakistan, where the number of civilians killed far outnumber those targeted. These deaths have caused wide backlash in Pakistan, putting the people there at odds with their government, which is on the American government's payroll for foreign aid. The war in Iraq has had the greatest human toll so far, estimated at at least 100,000 and upwards of a million people dead, with more displaced. On top of that is the now accepted practice, the assassination of American citizens by presidential decree without charge or trial. We saw this first in the killing of Anwar al-Awlaki in Yemen, and then his son, Abdul Rahman al-Awlaki, months later as he was at a backyard barbecue with his family and friends. Both were targeted and destroyed by separate drone strikes. Abdul Rahman was born in Denver and never saw his 17th birthday. His only crime, according to, the, according to Obama campaign senior advisor Robert Gibbs, was that he should have had a more responsible father. As if that's something somebody can control. The human costs of this war are staggering, but that's not the only thing that's being destroyed. In the name of security, the American government has transformed itself into a complete police state, with every citizen under electronic surveillance of some kind. Dissidents are being intimidated into silence. The Fourth Amendment right to be free from search and seizure without due process is gone. The TSA routinely violates dignity and the person of people at the airports. The Patriot Act gives police the power to essentially write their own search warrants. And now, um, H.R. 347, signed by Barack Obama, gives government officials who find protests unfavorable in their areas the power to exclude them from federal bu federal buildings or property. And now we have the 2012 NDAA, which also authorizes the indefinite detention of American citizens without charge or trial. For any reason, the right of habeas corpus is gone. There was also a recent example of a former military veteran, Brandon Raub, who was accused of mental illness based on certain Facebook posts and held without charge for days before a judge ordered his release. The police state is here, and it is not pretty. Hang on, let me get that page. <laughs> what can we do about this? Well, the solution is pretty simple. We must bring the troops home, stop policing the world, and start respecting the rights of all people everywhere, and dismantle the homeland security state. The 19th century political economist Frederick Bastiat said that when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. Trade and peaceful voluntary commerce and cultural exchange 
are absolutely necessary for peace. Without it, it becomes very easy for the public to hate a supposed enemy it doesn't understand or see on a regular basis. We need to say no at the local level to the police state and work to peacefully oppose it. We can't really count on politicians in Washington who work to put these things in place. But what can we individually do to oppose war? Well, the Washington war machine is a monstrosity like few others in history, but it can be put in check, and it is going to happen one way or the other. Either through economic pressure, our troops will be coming home, or we can call for the troops to come home before that happens and avoid the economic consequences that come with it. Because all empires end. Each and every one of us can do something for peace. The first thing to do is to know what's going on and know the facts so that you can educate yourself and others on what's going on, what's happening. Then go into your communities and into your spheres of influence and speak out against the war. We must bring the truth about war into the public eye. Make it known that not all quietly and blindly support Washington's war machine, and that it's the right thing to do. As the anti-war movement goes on, I am a Johnny-come-lately. Organizations like the Idaho Peace Coalition and others have been promoting the ideas of peace for quite some time. And there are ways that we can promote this idea here, either by joining an anti-war organization, starting your own, telling your friends, even holding a sign that causes somebody to think. It's this way that we can withdraw our consent and make the war even less popular. Discouraging folks from joining the military is also a worthwhile undertaking. Albert Einstein said that the pioneers of a warless world are the youth who refuse military service. It's up to us to be involved where we can, and who knows what can happen. Lives may be saved by our actions, but one thing is certain, silence is tantamount to consent. The lives overseas are just as precious as the lives here, and we can't depend on politicians or presidents to put an end to the violence that they helped to create. Someone has to speak for these people. If not us, then who will? I have two final thoughts that I'd like to leave you with. American empire is not a new thing. Mark Twain was one of the prominent figures of the Anti-Imperialist League in the earliest, early 20th century and he faced some of the exact same challenges that we do today. In his day, he was against conquering and occupying the Philippines. He said, I have read carefully the Treaty of Paris, and I have seen that we do not intend to free, but to subjugate the people of the Philippines. We've gone there to conquer, not to redeem. And so I am anti-imperialist. I am opposed to having the eagle put its talons on any other land. He was ridiculed and violently opposed, but his words ring true today, he also said only the dead are permitted to tell the truth. Let us tell the truth while we yet live. The second and final thought that I have is this. What if the government held a war and nobody showed up? <laughs> Dan Peterman. Next will be Dan Peterman. He's going to be giving a speech on behalf of Paul Smith, who's a military veteran that I had invited to come. Unfortunately, he had a conflict uh, scheduling and wasn't able to attend, but I'm glad to have Dan here to give his speech.